Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Gerald Steinberg. Uh, he is on the faculty of the political studies at Bar Ilan University. Um, uh, he's a member of BESA. Uh, he's the founder of the program on conflict management and negotiation and president of the NGO Monitor, where he has displayed uh, much courage uh, in recent years. It's not easy to take on this type of organizations. He specializes in international relations, Middle East politics, negotiations and diplomacy, soft power and the politics of non-governmental organization. He also uh, has worked with a number of international organizations such as NATO, UN University, Austria, CIPRI. He is uh, widely quoted uh, in the international press. He is very active with op-eds in uh, the Jerusalem Post, Wall Street Journal, International Herald Tribune, The Age, Australia, and many other places. Uh, his recent publications include NGOs, Human Rights and Political Warfare in the Arab-Israeli Conflict, another one, Europe's Failed Middle East Policies, another one, Uncivil so Society Ideology, Human Rights and Antisemitism. Uh, he will speak to us on the immoral mythologies of asymmetrical warfare and civilian victims. Thank you, Ephraim. Thank you to all the speakers who have spoken and will be speaking. This conference focuses on the right of democracies to self-defense. And all of the speakers have talked about the problematics, challenges that democracies face. Israel has been dealing with this issue of responding to and defending itself against what we call asymmetric warfare a different type of uh, attack, a different type of threat, taking place, being launched from civilian population centers. We've seen it for decades in Israel. We saw it in, from most, most recently in the Lebanon War of 2006, rockets and missiles being fired at Israeli cities from southern Lebanon, from Lebanon. Do I have to do something with this now? Okay, I'm sorry, I thought you were setting it up. I can't do two things at once. I can barely chew gum and walk at the same time these days. Okay, is that what I have to do? You, uh, yeah. Why don't you just go ahead and get it set up so I can talk about bin Laden and a few other things. Uh, oh, logistics are always the hard part. The, uh, the war from Gaza, the attacks from Gaza, taking place from most densely populated uh, areas of the world, from mosques, from hospitals, from schools, a few days ago, we saw mass marches, civilians going into Israeli territory, bus there with the cooperation of the Syrian army. 90 buses don't get to the Israeli border in Syria without somebody somehow giving approval. And we are told that that was involved uh, Iran and pressure from Hezbollah on the Syrian regime. And the problem was always, how do you respond to this? Israel didn't open fire on the masses of, uh, Syria, uh, of Palestinians coming through Syria. Clearly, had it done so, that would have been called a massacre. Israel was, is already being accused, as we heard just now, by those who will accuse Israel of, uh, for, at every occasion of having violated international law. We had the Goldstone Report, over 500 pages, filled with accusations of violations of international law. And if I ever get my PowerPoint going here, I can show you some much more detailed illustrations. Okay. Well, eventually we'll get this up and running. This is not uniquely an Israeli problem. And after the uh, targeted assassination, I think is the best way, or the execution of bin Laden, we almost immediately afterwards, we saw the heads of organizations that used the term human rights, particularly Human Rights Watch, that were attacking this. Ken Roth, who was quoted earlier, runs an organization with a budget of around $40 million a year, has a great deal of, pub of visibility in the media, goes to the White House and participates in events on human rights, uh, goes to Geneva, goes to many other places, to Davos, one of, is often called one of the, the heads of one of the world's watchdog organizations, and condemned the operation against bin Laden and said, 
almost exactly what he said when uh, Israel um, had a similar attack against uh, Hamas leaders, particularly Sheikh Yassin, said that these, uh, this was an uh, illegal act, an unjust act, that the United States should have arrested and brought bin Laden to trial. And the problem with statements like that are the, the complete absence of any understanding, either willful, because it's ideologically driven, or simply out of ignorance, of the, of the extremely complex environment and the consequences of what are ext very simplistic statements like this. Are we almost ready here? Yeah, yeah. When Human Rights Watch condemned every Israel operation like this with the same type of language, there was absolutely no thought given to what, what would be the consequences of going in to Gaza, what would have been the consequences of going into Abbottabad, arresting a leading terrorist, bringing that person out, holding them, bringing them to trial. How many different terrorist attacks would be taking place in the process of this whole operation? How many people would be killed? soldiers and civilians, in sending a tank column into Gaza and bringing out Sheikh Yassin for trial. I'm using this as an example because the argument, the broader argument is that much of what, is, what passes for um, moral and legal arguments and factual and even military arguments, which are condemnatory of the efforts made by democracies to defend themselves against this type of asymmetric warfare or, to use a simple word, complete nonsense. And I'm going to show you illustrations of that as I go through and talk about the power of particularly the non-governmental organization network that has claimed and is often seen as the arbiters of human rights, of international law, of international morality, how baseless the claims are, but how much we, how many resources they have in order to promote that agenda. And we're almost ready here to get this, get the illustrations uh, more visible on this process. It's the combination of a very strong ideology, the lack of expertise, and I'll give you also explicit examples of that. We're making progress here. Ha, okay, thank you. If you wanna dim the lights, that's fine. Yeah, just not, not too strongly. And what I'm going to do, I don't claim that in the 20 minutes that I have that I'm going to be able to solve these problems. We have a full two days of a conference dealing with this in many different ways. And there are, these are extremely complex. Certainly the next panel has some of the world's experts that are going to be speaking on this and have dealt with these issues in different ways. And later on we'll talk about it from a military perspective. What I want to start doing is by focusing on and questioning the myths that dominate these discussions. In order to have a serious analysis, the, the slogans, the cliches, the myths have to be removed from the, from the um, dominant position that they're in. So first, I just want to give you the examples of Ken Roth and Ian Levine from Human Rights Watch. It's not justice on bin Laden for him to be killed, even if justified, no trial, no conviction. No way that this could happen, no thought, but that was the head of an organization with about 40 to $50 million a year on the record, making this kind of a statement, it's not unique. Somebody else who works for Human Rights Watch, the system has recovered from a serious error. We're happy about that. Uh, unfortunately, we can't say that's about the international system or the Human Rights Council or uh, Human Rights Watch. But Ian Levine from Human Rights Watch, also roughly on the same time, talks about bin Laden, the death of bin Laden, and he compares this with the efforts by the United States and, and democracies to defend themselves so he talks about a horrific chapter of human rights abuses in the name of counterterrorism. I have to say that within a few hours, Human Rights Watch removed this from its website and, and basically vanished without a trace. We, part of what we do is we make sure we have screenshots so that when these kinds of statements are made, they can't later say, oh, we never did this as an invention or a lie as other organizations tend to use. Now, I think it's important before I talk about the myths to go back to the, the foundations. Human rights, as Hillel Neuer talked about, the concept of the modern human rights movement and the universal declaration of human rights came in the wake of the Holocaust. It was part of and led by individuals like Eleanor Roosevelt. The point that I want to make in this very quick discussion of the foundations is the universality. 
Human rights are indivisible. There are not different human rights for Israelis, for Chinese, for Tibetans, for Chechnyans, for anybody else. And yet the entire structure and the mythology of human rights has become one of exactly non-universality. And I will give you many examples, I don't have to, we've heard a number of them, where all of these uh, terminology, all the language, the rhetoric, the terminology, the claims of uh, international law and violation of international law are not used in a universal way, but are used in a very selective and ideologically bound way, particularly focusing on democracies or focusing on democracies and very specifically focusing on Israel. So the universality, universal jurisdiction, as Raphael talked about, which is supposed to, again, deal with the universal application of genocide law uh, conventions and human rights conventions and when violators are able to escape being held accountable because of the, the totalitarian nation or the regimes that they lead, that they can then be brought to trial. How that whole mechanism has been abused completely as part of this political process. I trace the these mythologies and this entire the set of campaigns particularly focused on Israel to the 2001 United Nations Durban Conference for the Elimination of Racism uh, and Discrimination and Other Forms of Xenophobia, where the primary target was Israel. The language that it was used is precisely the language that we see being implemented for the last decade, which is to apply the label of racism, of apartheid, of war crimes, of ethnic cleansing against Israel through the use or the abuse of moral language moral rhetoric in order to achieve precisely the opposite, in order to, as it says, impose a policy of complete and total international isolation of Israel as an apartheid state. Now, I'll just note that nowhere in this is there any mention of occupation or settlements or any of those other issues which tend to be the common currency. This is what we saw a couple of days ago. This is the Nakba philosophy that Israel itself is a racist apartheid state and must be eliminated. The Durban strategy gets implemented time after time. We've got five or six different examples of my colleagues from NGO Milo who are sitting here uh, have documented this in great detail, where you have statements like Israel committed a massacre that are made, this goes back to Janine, or uh, in the case of Beit Hanun, that Israel has committed grave war crimes, disproportionate use of force, and uh, we, in the Lebanon war, many other examples where these, this language is, is introduced and repeated many, many times by these powerful NGOs immediately, immediately adopted, and this is an issue that has to be discussed tomorrow, by journalists in the media. There is almost no questioning of the accuracy or biases or applicability of the claims that are made in these reports by journalists. I don't know any competent journalists in Israel or elsewhere, who if the IDF makes a statement that said that we didn't fire in this area, won't go and check the evidence. But if an NGO says we have evidence here, we have interviewed witnesses, and Israel committed war crimes, that's a front page story without any question. And then of course that feeds into the entire UN process and we have a independent or not independent inquiry and the, the Goldstone Report is simply the culmination of that process. And then my colleagues in academia very often will put footnotes on these, U, on these NGO reports or on the newspaper versions or on the uh, UN version of those reports, quote them as established facts with no value added. The Goldstone process is, a, is an example of this facade of international law and, and human rights being applied for this form of political warfare. The entire report was based on a cut and paste job. Over 500 NGOs are quoted in there. The question of who actually wrote the, wrote the uh, Goldstone report is still a very valid question. Uh, and I, I think, uh, Hilla, you're also working on this in some ways and trying to, to get this information out there. What's interesting, is the quote that Goldstone himself made repeatedly. He said, if this was a court of law, there would have been nothing proven. And yet the report itself has recommend, legal recommendations using terms like war crimes, calling for action by the International Criminal Court, by the Security Council. So it's a, it's, it's a facade, it's a very clear and knowing facade. We don't claim it has judicial validity, there was no cross-examination of witnesses. I could spend an hour and a half just talking about how completely bogus, to use a, um, a non-academic term, this report was. 
And yet it uses the language and makes the recommendations as it has been adopted very broadly as if it was a, a legitimate legal document, a judicial document. Now, to his credit, Judge Goldstone, a year and a half after the report was issued, recognized this in a, I'd say, a very courageous op-ed article that was published in the Washington Post in which many of those who adopted and embraced Goldstone immediately rejected him after he said there were things that were wrong with this report. And the statements that he made, I think, are very clear and indicative of the fact that he himself recognized not just that it wasn't a judicial, judicial inquiry, but that it used the mythology of military expertise, of legal expertise, of even trying to understand what happened on the ground as a very blunt instrument for, a, for political attacks, particularly against Israel. There is a large movement to develop this. As I said, this is not isolated. The types of cases that Raphael talked about, the abuse of uni universal jurisdiction in order to label Israelis as war criminals in Spain, in the UK. We've had cases uh, in many other countries as well. This is not something that happens spontaneously, but is a very carefully developed strategy. This is an image from an Al Jazeera broadcast of a conference that took place in Cairo, November 2008, a couple of months before the Gaza war on the impunity and prosecution of Israeli war criminals. So many of these universal jurisdiction cases, as my colleague Ann Hertzberg has documented in her report, are based on these activities by the strategies developed by these NGOs, well financed, and this conference itself, I think much to the, the shame of the European Union, thanks to the European Union and an organization called Oxfam Novib, which is a Dutch-based humanitarian charity, I put those terms in quotes, funded largely by the Dutch government, which has promoted this type of abuse of international law and, um, and the, the way that, uh, and, and human rights. Where do these, in, in spe specific focuses, where do these uh, mythologies take place? There are thousands of pages of reports that are written about Israel. There are hundreds of pages, maybe more, of reports alleging human rights abuses by the United States. There are five, at least five dimensions that over the years we have shown to be the, the uh, foci of, the, of these abuses. Much of the evidence is unverifiable and unsourced. You read those reports and you say, where did you get this? Where did they get this from? And sometimes they'll say that a human rights or amnesty or B'Tselem or some research was is in this area at this time. What's the name of the person? What language does he or she speak? Usually, the languages that are spoken by the, quote, researchers are not the languages of the people in the area, which means there was a translator. How was the translator done? We know that in many cases where evidence was, evidence in quotes, was taken in Gaza, there was a member of Hamas, a Hamas um, official, either in the room or out of the room. So the verifiability of evidence is hugely problematic. The context is released, is, is erased usually. So what you're told about are war crimes, but you're not told about how the response took place. You don't have the picture of the missiles being fired from a school in Gaza. What you see only is the Israeli response. The exploitation of humanitarian legal terms. Is Gaza still occupied? According to many of the NGOs, Gaza is occupied and Israel is responsible for collective punishment. And if you do a search of Human Rights Watch and the use of collective punishment, a very, very loaded term with echoes of the Holocaust, you find that they almost never use it in any other conflict situation, only Israel. And selective use of data. We have, and I'll show you a quick slide, I won't have time to go to it. We've looked, my colleague Avi Bell, who will be speaking tomorrow, and I are working through thousands of pages of reports of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International on, Lebanon, on the Lebanon War, and you see very clearly where they erase large parts of, of the available data in order to make their ideological point. And finally, Israel is treated with double standards. That happens over and over again. The same methodologies are not used in other areas of the world. The facade of military expertise, very quickly, Mark Golasco was the Human Rights Watch senior military analyst. Uh, in addition to the fact that he, his hobby was collecting Nazi war memorabilia and being photographed in an SS, um, I thought it was a jacket, whatever he's being photographed here. Or, um, the question of what kind of actual expertise he had is very questionable. 
He has some background, had some background in the Department of Defense involving targeting. Whether he had any of the abilities to distinguish certain types of weapons that he claims to be able to see in his reports is very questionable. And real experts have argued and, and uh, refuted his claims. And yet, he is quoted everywhere in Human Rights Watch. In contrast, Colonel Richard Kemp, the head of the British forces in Afghanistan, who does have real expertise, who testified exactly the opposite types of, of claims before Goldstone elsewhere, well, his testimony is entirely erased. So this very, the questionable, it, it walks the wall, they walk the walk and talk the talk of military expertise, but most of these organizations do not have it, or they certainly don't demonstrate that they have this expertise. Legal expertise, the claims that are made, I mentioned it briefly, and others will talk about it in more detail. I only have five minutes. He says two, but I'm going to... Anyway, the, the st statements speak for themselves. Allegations of genocide by an organization of al Haq, whose head also is, uh, um, has some connections with the PF PFLP terrorist organization, and using this kind of a language. Uh, here, the, the, the uh, B'Tselem referring to the killing of Nizar Rayyan and uh, linking that to civilian lives in a grave breach of international law. Nizar Rayyan was the head of the, uh, the uh, Hamas um, military wing, uh, very active in attacks against Israel, clearly not a civilian by any reasonable defini definition. And many other uses or abuses of legal terminology in order to make this kind of, uh, or to use it for this type of political warfare, and essentially to deny Israel the right to self-defense. The, attack, the attacks are barely treated. The responses are the focus of these huge type of, of political um, and, and public relations campaigns. And therefore, what you have is the ability to attack, but not the ability to respond. I'm not going to go into this slide, but these are the 12 cases that we looked at in, in Lebanon and looked at all the internal contradictions that are made in them, the question of well, how, what are their sources for claims of military necessity or not. In many cases, there are no sources or in cases of where they claim eyewitnesses and the way they use le legal claims. What we've got here is 12 cases, four different categories, 48 examples of which the majority of which we are going to demonstrate are not at all, these are reports by Human Rights and Amnesty, are not at all uh, substantiated, but in fact, the opposite takes, is, the, is the case. And yet, these are exactly the types of reports that are reported in the media for, as evidence of Israeli war crimes and reported in UN sources and even in United States uh, uh, State Department reports, which also adopt, often without question, the claims made by these politicized NGOs. They're able to get away with it because of huge budgets. I won't get into it because I don't have time, but just so you see the types of money that's involved. The European Union funds on the order of 100 million euros per year to organizations that focus on the Arab-Israeli conflict through the facade of human rights. Yeah. Much of this funding, by the way, remains secret. Remain, we don't know who makes these decisions. Electronic Intifada, we, it, it turns out, was funded by the Dutch government. The Dutch government didn't even know, know about this. So what do we do about this in the last couple minutes that I have? Resetting the agenda. <laughs> of resetting the human rights agenda. You can read it, restoring morality to human rights. Removing the political focus and making it moral and universal. If you claim expertise, you have to show that in fact that exists, not simply make that claim, following the money, naming and shaming for these abuses is central, and developing alliances with the real victims of human rights whose voices have been shut down through this obsessive, distorted, focus on democracies and on Israel. Human Rights Watch is an example of how that naming and shaming process has worked. This is an organization claiming a human rights agenda who goes to Saudi Arabia to raise money in order to attack what they call, call the, uh, the pro-Israeli lobby. I think that, that's mostly me and the NGO monitors in that context. The hiring of someone who's an obsessive collective Nazi memorabilia to be your senior military analyst. Appoint a, uh, to your board the head of Al-Haq, who is also uh, an activist with a, with a terrorist organization. Human Rights Watch's uh, reputation has suffered greatly to the point where the founder, Robert Bernstein, has parted company and has formed a new and hopefully more successful organization called Advancing Human Rights. And finally, the reports that are not written. This is the lack of universality. Not a single report on Gilad Shalit. Yeah, occasionally, after three or four years, they made a few statements, but there are no campaigns. You don't see Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and B'Tselem and Gisha and Yesh Dean and all those other organizations out there campaigning for Gilad Shalit and many other examples of the failure of universality. 
There's a lot more to be said about this, but the main point is that in order to deal with these challenges of asymmetric warfare, democracies in general, Israel in particular, are going to find, have to find a way to deal also with the political attacks. Thank you. Thank you.